Valentine's Day is coming, so we're kind of devoting this day to that subject. And of course, you've been to church a million times and heard people talk about love. So we're going to talk about love today, but we're going to talk about it hopefully in a different way. I really want to shift your thinking about that. I want you to come to understand some things about this concept of love. For many of us, it's a powerful emotion. And we tend to direct that emotion onto either people or possessions or purpose in life. We direct it onto people and we want to be with them forever or we love our children or our friends. We want to be with them or we, we direct it onto possessions like, oh, I got to have those shoes or I want that house or that necklace or that car. Thank you. <laughs> that car <laughs> or that motorcycle, whatever. And we direct it onto possessions and then we sometimes direct it onto purpose. If you're a person who loves to dance, then whenever you will, you will never be completely and fully happy unless you're dancing. And if you're an artist, you want to paint or you want to sculpt or you want to create. If you're a singer, you really want to sing. So we have this desire and we, and we interpret that as, as love. But I want to suggest to you that that's something else, something actually deeper than that. And if we can understand the depth of that, it can be huge in our steps to liberation. Remember, this is a year of liberation. I want you to come to understand that love is a power. And it is a power that is in you now. So when anyone tells me, I don't have enough love in my life, that to me is like a fish saying there's not enough water when they're in the middle of the ocean. The power is in us. It is not something that comes to us. Now that's a shift, and I'm going to explain how that works in just a minute. If we can understand that, it is the way that we then step into being these incredible spiritual beings that we've been called to be in the world. But we can't do it until we claim the power that is in us, and that power is the power of love. Charles Fillmore is the co-founder of this movement called Unity, and he gave a wonderful definition of love. He said that love in divine mind, now divine mind is his way of saying the mind of God or the, the, the thought in the heart of God. Love in the God's mind is the idea of universal unity. It is the power that joins and binds together the universe and everything in it. Two things to get from this. One, that love is a power. Not an emotion, not a reaction to something. It is a power that unites and joins. So now think back. We love people. What do you want to do when you see someone you love? You want to be with them. If it's the right one, you want to marry them forever, never, never, never let them go. We hope. We hope. And if it's family, you want to live close. Whatever it is, if it's a person, we want to feel... I want you to get it's a sense of wanting unity. It, there, is a, there is a thing like magnetism or gravity. That's what love is. And it wants things to come together to be one. Because the whole universe has this unspeakable, undescribable energy that wants things to be in singularity. Wants a oneness of all things. And that's because that's what God is. And that energy that's doing that is love. So when you love a possession... Can you walk by the store and see the beautiful shoes and go, aren't they nice, and then go on? I've seen that commercial. It doesn't happen. <laughs> you have to stop because you're TiVoing the show at home, and you go in and you buy them because you're not going to feel complete until those shoes are on your feet. And then they're in your closet, but they're never far away. Or that necklace. It's lovely there, but it would be even more fantastic. You see the energy that wants the oneness? It sees the object, and it wants it. Do you understand? That's because love isn't about desire. It's about unity. It's the same thing with purpose. If you have in you a spirit that is dancing, and then you hear the music, and you're not dancing, you are not one with the music. You have to dance to be one with the music. And then, you see, it's that, we call it the love of dance, but no, it's the unity, that power of love that creates unification. Do you understand that? Do you see it? Because if it wasn't, I mean, think about it. 
How frustrating would life be if we had to spend every moment chasing after our desires? I have to find all these people. I have to gather this love around me. And then I have to gather all these possessions. And then I have to be in my life's purpose. And then we're running ourselves ragged. We will never find peace if that's what we're doing. So the solution for that is what I want to talk about today. So you can be at peace and be completely surrounded with a sense of love at every moment. We get a hint from this from one of the core Hindu teachings called the Bhagavad Gita where it says when you see the stainless unity of God everywhere you become established in God and you rise above the constant changes of this world. Do you notice the theme of the stainless unity of God? So if I can see that stainless unity of all people with me, I don't need to marry everybody or have everybody be my friends in Facebook. I don't need to do all those things because I know our unity already. It's the same thing with possessions. In, in an earlier time in my life, I was one of those weird people that loved antiques. I loved older things. My mother loved old people, and I loved old people, and I loved old stuff, and it was just great. And if you've ever been to an antique mall, it's filled with old stuff. And I loved it. But when I would go into the antique malls, and I would find something, and I would love it, you know what? I had to have it. Because somehow, I was confusing love with ownership. You don't have to own it, to love it. I want to say that again, because that's really, really important. I don't want you guys to miss it up here in front. You don't have to own it, to love it. It took me a long time to learn that, and I collected a lot of stuff. Now, when I go to the mainland, I like to go to Kansas City. I get to go several times a year. They have wonderful antique malls there. And I can walk through all of them. And I really love all the old electronic stuff, the old radios and the wind-up phonographs and all that. I can pick it up and I can love it. And it's fantastic. I can smell the old plastic on the labels and it's great. And then I can put it down and I can walk away. And I have been blessed and I feel like I've experienced it and it's fantastic and I can move on. That's a difference. That's a kind of detachment. And that's... It's not easy for us as human beings. I want to give you a way to think of love and looking at love that can maybe make that easier. Charles Fillmore, again, the, uh, the, the co-founder of Unity, talked about how love actually works. Now, we talk about love all the time, but people don't really know how it works, and this is how it works. He says, love is an inner quality that sees good everywhere and in everybody. It insists that all is good. And by refusing to see, to see anything but good, it causes that quality finally to appear in the uppermost in itself and in all things. Love is the great harmonizer and healer. Now, that's a rather long definition, but I'm going to give you an example of how love works. It's very simple. We're going to sing a song together. And I know you know the song. Even people from Copenhagen this morning knew the song. It's called Row, Row, Row Your Boat. Okay? I'm going to start it, and I want you all to sing along with me. We're going to sing it. Ready? Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merry, merry, merry. Life is but a dream. Okay, did you hear yourself? You were pretty good. Let's sing it one more time. I want you to really listen to yourself and everybody together. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. I have just given you an example of how love works. Sound is a vibration. And different vibrations have different pitches. If you know anything about music, you know that. So I gave you all a note to start on. I said, row, row, row your boat. And you know what you all did? You went, row, row, row your boat. And you all matched that pitch. Did you know that? You didn't even think about it, did you? You just started singing it. Love is a vibration. 
It's a power that I have as a vibration, and I can send that vibration to you. And without you even thinking about it, you will begin to quiver inside with that same vibration, because it's the law of harmony. You will, you will feel that vibration, and then you will start to sing back in your love energy back to me. And then we will be at one, and we will be healed. That is how love works. It is a vibration that we emit to the world. The world feels it, and then they vibrate that thing back to us. Do you understand? Now, that is a powerful concept that I want you to understand you have within you now. You don't need love to do that. It is created in you by virtue of the fact that you are part and parcel of what is made up of God. You are love. The first book of John says God is love and God is in you. That nuclear reactor of emotional love is in you and it's just waiting to vibrate out into the world. And when you do, you change the world. So when we look at this statement even in more detail, we get hung up sometimes on the word good. And I knew somebody was going to come up to me because love sees good everywhere. And somebody's going to say, yeah, well, good means this or good means that. So I looked it up for you. Just so we know, we're all on the same page. This is from Internet Dictionaries. Good is from the old English word, believe it or not, God. It means having the right or desirable quality, belonging together, from a base word meaning to unite. Are you getting a theme here? That good, love, God, all about uniting and oneness it's powerful, and we have that vibratory power within us. So Charles Fillmore's definition says love sees the good, love insists on the good, and love refuses all else. That's a tall order, and it can be done. Love, first of all, let's look at one at a time. Love sees the good. That means that no matter what is happening, no matter what it may look like, what we're going to be facing, we're going to claim right away before we get there that we're going to see the good. It's going to be good. There's a woman named Patricia Baker. She was 92 years old. Her husband had died after being married. They were married for 70 years. She was going to be admitted to a nursing home. She was legally blind. So she sat in the waiting room. And when the time came that they were ready for her room, the nurse called her and said, let's go. And she took her walker, and they're going up to the elevator to go up to her apartment in this nursing home. And the nurse begins to explain to her how beautiful the little apartment is. She says, oh, you're going to love it. There's these beautiful lace curtains, and there's a window that overlooks the garden down below. And, and, and it's going to be real. And, and Miss Baker said, I love it. And the nurse said, but you haven't even seen it yet. And the woman said, how the furniture is arranged makes no difference in my mind. It's how my mind is arranged that makes the difference. And I have decided that I will love it. You see, that vibration of love she sent out ahead of time, she was going to love it no matter what, and she did not see it. She knew it here before. Second thing is love insists on the good. And that's because sometimes the circumstances that we are actually in don't even really look or feel good. And people are giving us a message that's saying, you know, I don't know, I don't know. This may not be good. There was a man named Jerry who was an owner of a restaurant, and people loved him. He was one of those totally positive people. If you were to ask him, how are you doing today? He'd say, oh, if I was any better, I'd have to be twins. <laughs> you probably heard people say that. It was like, oh, yeah. Well, he was, and all the, he was a manager, and all the waiters that, and waitresses that worked for him, they loved to work for him, and, and wherever he moved jobs, they would go with him because he was such a positive person. Well, one night he did something that you should never do as a restaurant owner late at night. He left the back door open. And some thieves came in to rob the place. And they had him at gunpoint, and he was having to open the safe, and his hands were shaking so bad he couldn't get the numbers lined up right. Someone from the outside had seen what was going on and called the police. And as the sirens were coming, the thieves panicked 
and they shot him several times and left. So the paramedics came and they picked him up and it looked bad, but they kept saying, oh, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. And they took him and he got into the hospital and they were wheeling him in and he's looking up at the faces of all the doctors and the nurses and they're looking down like this is really serious and they're working furious. They look at him and they don't see much hope. And this big nurse was leaning over him and she says, are you allergic to anything? <laughs> they always ask that. And he took a breath and he said, yes. And of course, if you say yes, you're allergic to something, to doctors and nurses in the hospital, they stop cold. They're not going to do anything until they know what's wrong with you. And he took a big breath as hard as he could and he said, bullets. <laughs> <laughs> And of course they laughed. He got their attention and then he looked at him and he said, please, I am deciding to live. Operate on me as a living person because they had given up. And he of course survived and continued to tell people, oh, if I was any better, I'd be a twin. You want to see my scar? <laughs> Show me <the> scar. <laughs> So sometimes drawing on that power means that in the face of circumstances and people looking at us and saying, oh, it looks bad, you have to be the one to declare. Even if it's the center of attention is on you and things look really awful, you have to be the one to declare, no, I am loving life and I'm declaring love and sending this energy of love and I am refusing to see anything else. And still, there are times when, when people will tell us that it's not good. They don't only look like it's not good, but they tell you that it's not good. My mother had a saying, she was from the South, and she'd say, honey, when people say bad things to you, just turn a deaf ear. Now, some of you don't know what a deaf ear is, but when I grew up, not everybody could afford two hearing aids, so you could only afford one which could be very convenient. Because if somebody was yammering away over here and you didn't want to hear it, you just turned your deaf ear over there. <laughs> and you continued to listen to the television. It was fine. <laughs> so it was kind of, it's a Southern expression. So turning a deaf ear means, in a sense, don't pay any attention to what people are saying when they're giving you negative information about your life. The story about this group of frogs, they were hopping through the forest and two of them fell in this very deep pit and all the other frogs gathered around and they looked down and it was really deep. And they said, oh man, there's no way you're going to get out of here. It's too deep. You'll never get out. And they were down there trying to jump and they were trying to get out. And there the frogs on top going, man, you're never going to get out. It's too deep. Just give up and die. <laughs> well, one frog tried and he says, oh, they're right. And he laid down and he died. But the other frog kept jumping. He kept jumping, and the people on the other frogs on top, it's too tall, it's too deep, you'll never get out. You might as well give up, you're never going to get out. And he just kept jumping and jumping and jumping, and he actually made it. He made it. Because he was deaf. He thought all those frogs were saying, come on, you can do it, you can make it, only another more inch, come on, come on. <laughs> so what I suggest to you is, when you're getting ready to send your power of love and you have people to tell you, oh, don't send your love there, you can't send, oh, you're wasting your love over there, turn off your hearing aids and jump even higher because that's the way love will win. Here's a statement. I use my power of love to see good everywhere. Now remember, good means unification, so I'm seeing it everywhere. I'm gonna invite you to say this with me out loud. Let's say it. I use my power of love to see good everywhere. Good, let's do it again. Say it one more time with gumption. Remember gumption? Let's try it. I use, together, I use my power of love to see good everywhere. Beautiful. And I know it's not always easy. So I have some music to soften the truth for you. 
the words are simple. It says, I will send my love to all the world in all I think and say and do. For I know that only love can heal the hurt that stands between my heart and you. It goes like this. I want you to sing it with me, if you will. I will send my love to all the world With all I think and say and do For I know that only love can heal the hurt That stands between my heart and was good. Let's do it again. I will send my love to all the world with all I think and say and do. For I know that only love can heal the hurt that lies between my heart. The way I'd like you to use this is to think about some situation in your life where you feel a separation, some distance between someone you love. And I invite you in this moment to give up whatever may be right, whatever moral position we may take. This person doesn't even have to be living. It can be someone in your past. And I'm going to invite you to know oneness. And knowing that oneness is where you will find peace and real liberation. If you've got them in your mind, I want you to sing this song for them. I will send my love to all the world With all I think and say and do For I know that only love can heal the Will you close your eyes with me for just a moment, please? That vibration that you're sending out right now is real. And whether people are in your presence or not, whether they're in this life or not, it can be felt and it can make a change. It can help them to vibrate at a level of love that heals. I will send my love to all the world with all I think and say and do for I know that only love can heal the hurt that stands between my heart and you. In these quiet moments, let there be nothing that comes from your heart and mind but a vibration of love as we come to God now in the sacred and holy silence.